Apple International sales made a profit of 16 billion euros in 2011, according to an investigation by the European Union. However, its tax bill was less than 10 million euros. That's a tax rate of just 0.05%. By 2014, the tax rate had decreased even further to a mere 0.005%. That's like earning a million a year, but only paying 50 euros taxes. Now, we all know Apple is extremely good at making money. Its profit almost reached $100 billion in 2022. It's the second most profitable company in the world, while the corporate tax rate in the United States was 35% before 2017. Apple's tax rate outside of the US averaged only 3% per year. And it's not just Apple we're talking about here. There's also Microsoft, Google, Amazon, to name just a few. How have these tech giants managed to dodge the tax sniping of governments on literally trillions in global profits over the years? And how have the European Union, the United States and countries known as tax havens responded? In this video, we are going to discuss the mysterious tax game that is going on between these corporate giants and governments. All right, you can tell from the topic that today's content is a bit controversial and I know what you're thinking, taxes again, but don't panic. I'll try to skip the boring details. So when a company makes a profit, it has to pay corporate tax, just like individuals like you and I have to pay income tax on money we earn. But if a business operates solely in one country, tax is easy to calculate. When you're dealing with an international corporation like Apple, it becomes a lot more complicated very quickly. Simple example. Let's say Apple sold an iPhone in Canada for $1,000. But before that iPhone was sold, it passed through other countries for assembly of different parts. That can be countries like China, Japan, South Korea, United States. So how do you calculate the taxes Apple needs to pay on this single iPhone? You obviously can't apply the entire $1,000 to Canada's tax rate and pay all the taxes to Canada. In theory, the approach for multinational companies is to look at how much value the product has generated in a particular country, also called the value add. And that's what's taxed in that country. For example, the iPhone screen is made in South Korea. If the company making the screen generated a profit of $200, then they would be taxed at South Korea's corporate tax rate of 27.5%. So in other words, the profit generated from making the screen would be taxed and paid to the South Korean government. But now let's say that after all the assembly and manufacturing processes are complete, the iPhone is imported into Canada at a cost of $900. It's then sold for $1,000, resulting in a profit of $100. And this profit would then be taxed by the Canadian government at the Canadian corporate tax rate of 26.5%. By using this method, each country gets a fair share of taxes based on what part of the iPhone was made there. So the taxes are split up and sent to the countries where the iPhone's value was actually generated. Now I know that tax rules vary from country to country, but this is the basic idea how big companies usually handle taxes around the world. Simple, right? Eh, not exactly. This is purely theoretical. The biggest problem is that how would you define the actual value generated by this phone in each country, especially when there are a lot of subsidiaries involved in different countries, each following different tax rules. And another obvious issue is that not every country charges the same corporate tax rate. Some are high, some are low. And this creates a significant opportunity for manipulation. So you see, the goal for these multinational companies from a tax point of view is naturally to shift as much of their profit as possible to countries with lower tax rates and to use every trick available to minimize the overall taxes they have to pay. Why else would they employ an army of accountants and lawyers, right? So now that we understand the fundamental logic and goal, let's look at how Apple operates. In most countries, the taxation follows the logic we just discussed. But there is an exception, the United States. The US has a unique approach known as worldwide taxation that it's been following since the 1920s. What does this mean? If a company is registered in the United States, it is considered an American company. Therefore, regardless of the country where the money is earned, it must pay taxes to the United States. But of course, and we guessed it, there's a loophole. As long as the money isn't brought back into the United States, it is not subject to US taxes. And that's why Apple has been accumulating large amounts of cash overseas. For example, by 2017, Apple had amassed over $250 billion, which was even more than the entire foreign exchange reserves of the United Kingdom at the time. But they still have to figure out 
how to pay as little tax as possible on these overseas profits. And there are two things Apple did. First, they looked for a country with a very low tax rate and very favorable conditions in other business aspects. Then, they used some clever tax tricks to shift as much of their overseas profits as possible to this country. And which country was that? Ireland. Who would have guessed? But why would Apple choose Ireland as its overseas headquarters? Ireland's corporate tax rate is 12.5%. That's low, but not extremely low. So that can't be the real reason, right? Before 2018, the US had a tax rate of 35%, China 25%, and countries like Australia, France, Japan, Germany were all around 30%. But if you've watched my last video, you will know that there are those countries known as tax havens where the corporate tax rate is literally 0%. So why didn't Apple choose one of those instead of Ireland? The reason is the two things Apple cares even more about than reducing taxes, and that is its image and reputation. Think about it. Apple is a highly visible global company, a tech leader, a trendsetter, with the highest market value in the world. What would it look like if they casually decided to set up shop in some mystery zone like the British Virgin Islands? And when? <laughs> no, that's something Apple definitely doesn't want. It would definitely have a negative impact on the brand and undermine any ESG goals the company has. Now, look at Ireland. Developed country, it's part of the European Union. That wouldn't raise any eyebrows, right? But there are some other reasons that made Ireland almost the exclusive choice for Apple. But I'll leave that a mystery for now and discuss it later. So now the first step is done. Apple had chosen Ireland to be the place for its overseas headquarters. And the next step is to figure out how to transfer all of the profits there. And for that, let's go back to the initial example, the iPhone that sold in Canada for $1,000. So in Canada, its revenue is $1,000. Then let's say that the combined costs of the supply chain, labor, production, and assembly are $600 for argument's sake. This gives us a profit of $400. And it's those $400 that Apple would need to pay taxes on to the Canadian government. However, for technology companies like Apple, a significant portion of their value actually lies in intangible assets like trademarks and patents. So, in simple words, it's those trademarks and patents that have contributed the most to making those $400 profit. So it's not quite fair to say that all of those $400 of profit are made in Canada, right? And how do these companies use this to their advantage? Well, they assign these trademarks and patents to an overseas companies, such as the subsidiary in Ireland in Apple's case. And then this overseas branch will charge the Canadian subsidiary of Apple, the one that distributes the iPhones in Canada, a fee. This fee is basically for using Apple's trademarks and patents, also known as royalty payments. And now let's say they set that fee to $400. What does this mean? It means that the profit that was made from selling iPhones in Canada has been successfully offset. And as a result, there is no profit left to be taxed in Canada. Clever, right? But of course, this profit doesn't just vanish. It's simply transferred to Apple's Irish company, its overseas headquarter. And this is basically how companies that have a wealth of intangible assets can shift profits to other countries using royalty payments. Now the valuation of these patents is somewhat subjective, but as long as the royalty payments aren't outrageously high, whatever amount is declared is typically accepted. But hold your horses, doesn't about 95% of Apple's research and development occur in the United States? So why would an Irish company have the right to collect these royalty payments? And that's actually the reason why the US government investigated Apple in 2013. But Apple was very clever in their approach they came up with something called a cost-sharing agreement. Under this agreement, the Irish company pays for the research and development conducted by Apple in the United States, which basically means they own all the patents and trademarks coming out of the United States. And it's this very arrangement that allows the Irish company to charge royalty fees worldwide. Okay, now the profits have been shifted to Ireland, but why did I initially say that in 2014, Apple's tax was less than 0.01%? when Ireland's corporate tax rate is 12.5%. Was that a mistake? No, it wasn't. So you see, it's not actually the low-ish tax rate that attracted Apple to put up its overseas headquarter in Ireland. The real reason Apple chose Ireland is because before 2014, there was a loophole in Ireland's tax laws. In Ireland's case, taxation is determined by where a company is managed and controlled. So that means that as long as Apple makes its Irish subsidiary controlled by another overseas company, for example, a company on the Bermudas, 
then it's not within the Irish government's tax jurisdiction. And this way Apple cleverly avoided taxes in Ireland too. Of course, in reality, to legally and compliantly execute this scheme is a whole nother story. You need to set up several subsidiaries in Bermuda, the Netherlands and Ireland. And you have to shuffle profits back and forth through a bunch of agreements. This tactic has even been given a name. The one used by Apple is called the Double Irish. And there's another one, the Double Irish with a Dutch sandwich. Oh, I'm getting really hungry now. Of course, this doesn't mean that Apple doesn't pay any taxes at all overseas. It's just that they have reduced it by as much as they could. And in those years, Apple's average tax rate overseas was 3%. And it's because of this tax loophole in Ireland that most American multinational companies use this scheme to avoid taxes. And I want to stress here that I'm not just talking about a few, but indeed most American multinational companies all do this. Google, Meta, Apple, Amazon, you name them. By 2018, the cash hoarded in Ireland by American multinational companies had exceeded $1 trillion. That's enough to give every American $3,000. And this isn't just limited to tech companies. Do you know what industry Ireland is most famous for? It's pharma industry. Ireland is considered the pharmaceutical center of Europe. The world's largest pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, Roche, Bayer, Johnson Johnson have a presence in Ireland with very important research and development subsidiaries. Now the big question. All these global companies set up shop there and generate huge profits, yet they don't pay taxes to Ireland. Why doesn't Ireland just plug this tax loophole? Actually, this loophole is intentionally left open by Ireland. And the reason Ireland wants this is simple, because it creates a huge demand for talent, which in turn drives employment. And as a result, in Ireland, about one quarter of the jobs are provided by American companies and about 80% of all of the corporate income tax that Ireland collects is paid by American companies. And Ireland has now actually built a very comprehensive pharmaceutical industry. And even during the pandemic, Ireland was one of the most resilient developed countries. Its GDP grew by 15% in 2021. And a very important reason for this was its pharma industry. Speaking of Ireland's GDP, there's an interesting incident from 2015. See, the market had projected that Ireland's GDP growth would be 7.6%. But do you know what it actually turned out to be? A staggering 24.5%. It's really hard to believe that it's even possible for a developed country to achieve such a high growth rate. But this is actually related to its tax avoidance situation. Major companies transfer hundreds of billions of dollars in profits to Ireland every year. And while they don't pay taxes, the funny thing is the profit that is transferred to Ireland is actually counted in Ireland's GDP. Now let's have a look at Ireland's GDP per capita. What? It's over $100,000. That's double of what their neighbor the United Kingdom has and 1.5 times that of the United States. And now let's look at the countries with the highest GDP per capita globally, like Luxembourg, Bermuda, Singapore, the Cayman Islands, every single one of them is a tax haven, and so is Ireland. So with business practices like that, Ireland doesn't lose out. And for a company like Apple that has dodged taxes the way it has, it certainly doesn't lose out. But who does? It's those countries that could have collected those taxes, like the European Union. They've always been displeased with Ireland's tax loopholes. And finally, in 2016, after three years of investigation, the EU issued a directive. They stated that Apple, with the help of the Irish government, made a profit of 110.8 billion euros between 2004 and 2014 and barely paid any corporate taxes. As a result, the EU demanded that Apple pay back taxes of 13 billion euros. This was the largest so-called fine in history of global taxation. However, before Apple could respond to the EU's demand for a fine, Ireland jumped in. Ireland claimed that Apple hadn't violated any Irish tax laws and that the EU's actions were an infringement on Ireland's national sovereignty. So why was Ireland so anxious about this? Think about it. The impact of this fine on Ireland's reputation was immediate. They had intentionally left this loophole open as bait to attract multinational corporations. But with this fine, other companies like Microsoft, Google, Pfizer, started murmuring. Hey bro, have you heard Apple got fined over 10 billion euros for tax avoidance in Ireland? Maybe we shouldn't stay in Ireland. Let's pack up and leave. Suddenly, the fish didn't bite anymore. So can you blame Ireland for being a little worried? The truth is, however, that if Apple's tax tricks were completely legal, then there's nothing the EU could do, even if they're frustrated. So they had to find a reason. And they found one. Well, 
sort of. Usually these tax avoidance structures in Ireland have to add an additional layer in the Netherlands, the so-called double Irish with a Dutch sandwich. But Apple's double Irish didn't include the Dutch layer. So the EU argued that Ireland wasn't treating all companies equally, but had given Apple a backdoor, which was unacceptable to them. It seems, however, that the EU picked a rather weak point to challenge. In any case, Apple was furious. They appealed immediately, and even Tim Cook, who is usually very calm and composed, drastically changed his demeanor. He called the EU's accusations total political crap. And later in 2020, the European General Court indeed ruled in favor of Apple. However, the EU was not happy and appealed the decision before the European Court of Justice. And this legal battle is still going on. Okay now, let's talk about the US. With so many American companies keeping their money overseas, they too weren't happy. And in 2013, the US started pressuring Apple, even calling Tim Cook to a congressional hearing. So under intense pressure from the US, Ireland had no choice but to close the tax loophole in 2015. And this meant that companies could no longer use the double Irish with the Dutch sandwich. However, Ireland made a significant effort to accommodate these companies and gave them a five-year period to figure out new strategies. And so the tax lawyers for these big companies were back in business. Companies like Microsoft and Meta developed a tactic known as single mode, which involves an additional layer in Malta, but I won't go into that right now. Apple also developed its own new strategy. They found a small island called Jersey located near the UK and established a shell company there. By doing so, they cleverly avoided taxes once again. This tactic is known as Green Jersey. There definitely seems to be a keen interest in naming these strategies. Apple had been waiting for an opportunity to bring back money to the US for more than a decade. And then it finally arrived. The United States really couldn't sit still anymore. When Trump came to power, he began to implement tax reforms in 2017 that significantly reduced the corporate tax rate in the US from 35% to 21%. And for profits brought back from overseas, there was a one-time tax rate of 15.5%. But at the same time, a new rule was established. Profits made overseas would be taxed not only when brought back to the United States, but whenever they were made. In simple terms, the message was, we can give you tax cuts, but this money has to come back. And in the short term, this was massively beneficial for Apple. After all, having so much money sitting overseas wasn't ideal. And as a result, Apple finally decided to transfer over 250 billion in cash back to the US in 2017. And they paid 38 billion taxes all at once in the United States. And it's estimated that as a result of this tax reform, more than a trillion dollars in cash returned to the United States, resulting in over 100 billion dollars in back taxes paid. And it was precisely because Apple brought back its money to the US that it could initiate one of its largest stock buybacks in recent years. If you're wondering, Apple has spent over 500 billion US dollars on stock buybacks since 2012. Now, what does this mean? It means that instead of investing in new initiatives or acquisitions, Apple chose to buy back its own shares from the market. And this is basically their way of returning money to their investors. When we look at the entire span of the past decade or so, it appears that Apple has always tried to avoid the high tax in the United States. However, it didn't really pay much taxes to other countries either, including Ireland. And internal documents from the US government dating as far back as 1990 indeed revealed an awareness by the government that multinational corporations were stashing money in overseas tax havens. But the US government for the most part turned a blind eye to this because they knew that eventually this money would find its way back to the United States. And they were right. So you see, today we were seemingly discussing how companies like Apple avoid taxes, but in reality, we were also analyzing the competition among governments around the world. If you like the content, please leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.